Hello and welcome to the Apollo Awards for 2020. I'm Thomas Marx, the editor of Apollo magazine, and I'm delighted to be your host for this Apollo Awards video. Apollo has been recognizing achievements in the art and museum world since 1992. We usually celebrate the winners at a dinner and ceremony in London, but for obvious reasons, we've gone digital this year. I very much hope though, in the spirit of celebrating communication and encouraging conversation, that what our winners have to say will resonate with more people than ever through the video that you're watching. Our winners this year have been drawn from very strong shortlists. Members of Apollo's advisory boards, our regular columnists and contributors, and our senior editors have voted on them to choose the winners. And I'd like to thank all of those people for their valuable and decisive input once again. We're also very grateful to the London and Singapore-based law firm, Mishkondorea, for supporting this year's Apollo Awards. It's heartening to receive their backing and to know that they want to align themselves with the art sector, and also that they recognize the importance of culture as we look to recover from this crisis. I hand over to Amanda Gray, partner for art law at Mishkondorea, who's going to say a few words. I'm Amanda Gray, partner in art law at Mishkondorea. We spend our time as lawyers immersed in the art world and it's such a pleasure to support this year's Apollo Awards. Art Law at Mishcon was founded in 1995 and our international specialist practice was the first of its kind. Today, as a leader in the field, we have a presence in almost every aspect of the art market and our clients include international collectors, artists, dealers, art institutions, foundations, museums, galleries, governments and auction houses. We are delighted to see so much talent represented at this year's awards. Congratulations to all the winners as well as the nominees. During these challenging and difficult times, it is more important than ever to celebrate major achievements in the art and museum worlds. We look forward to working and meeting together and hope that in not too long, we'll be able to do so face to face rather than on the screen. Our first award is for Museum Opening of the Year. This may sound a little perverse in a year in which almost every museum around the world has been forced to close, in which not all have yet reopened and in which many are shuttered once again. Nevertheless, at Apollo, we believe that it's important to recognise those new or redisplayed museums or wings of museums that have and will allow us to think afresh about what and who museums are for. And I firmly believe that all of our nominees do that this year. The shortlist is Aberdeen Art Gallery, The Box in Plymouth, The British Galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Old Masters Picture Gallery and Sculpture Collection up to 1800 in Dresden, KBR Museum in Brussels, and the Yumizi Shilon Museum of Art in Ebeju Legi. The winner is a museum that is the first university art museum in its country, founded with a boldness of vision and with a founding collection and funding guarantee that augur an extraordinarily bright future. A clarion call, perhaps, to other projects in its country and even more widely across its continent. The Apollo Award for Museum Opening of the Year goes to the Yumizi Shilon Museum of Art. And I'm delighted that we're joined by Prince Shilon, whose gifts have made the museum possible, and by Jess Castellotte, its architect and founding director. Thank you so much, both uh, of you, for joining us. Jess, can I ask you to say a few words on behalf of the museum? Well, first, let, let me say how happy we are, not only for us, but uh, also uh, the fact that uh, an African institution uh, receives this important recognition globally. 
Mm. We are a small museum, a university museum. Mm. We just opened mm. thanks to the support mm, of Prince Shilon. Uh, this is a university museum in Pan Atlantic University in Lagos. But it, it, this is a, a teaching museum with an educational mission at the core of what we are and what we want to be. And Prince Shilon, let me ask you, were you always collecting with the idea of public display and education and teaching in mind? No, I didn't have that idea from the word go. I was just collecting as a young undergraduate and uh, my collection over the years grew and um, I found it necessary um, looking around me to um, in consonance with my pursuit of living a meaningful life of being useful to others. I now decided I was going to use my art collection um, to, to preserve, display and assist in teaching um, in a university setting. And so I decided I was going to invest in solely uh, building the museum and also granting about 1,000 works on loan to the university in perpetuity. And, and let me ask you what you see so far to date as the impact of the museum that bears your name and, and what you hope will be the impact in future years. The impact has been fantastic in the sense that it has opened uh, people's desire to want to pursue such such kind of goal. I see the museum being a catalytic pioneer to the development of um, such, such um, institutions in future uh, to promote art and culture and to um, preserve the works of art in uh, Nigeria for the use of, of, um, of the environment and also outside Nigeria. There is a lot of possibilities that uh, possib possibilities for the museum. And we are looking forward to the museum playing a very leading role in uh, preserving, conserving Nigerian art and also uh, promoting um, art education in Nigeria. Well, I think one of the really wonderful and, and um, heartening things about uh, Prince Shilon's gift and about the museum is, is the sustainability and the idea of the 15 years of funding that's been pledged to, towards the, the museum. But I suppose it must have been quite a difficult first year in which to have a new museum open. How has the museum reacted to some of the really unforeseen challenges of that first year? Well, it has been difficult. More than half of the time the museum has been open, we have been closed. Uh, we opened just one year ago. But this obvious and objective um, setback has moved us and, and pushed us to think a little bit more and now, after all these months, I think this has been positive. It has forced us to think, to, to go beyond what we were thinking before. For instance, initially we were thinking mainly of the physical visitors. Whom are we attracting? How can they, um, what can they get? What impact can we have on that? Now we are thinking of a much more ambitious um, audience. We are thinking of, of the, hundreds of thousands of Afro-Americans in the US, of the hundreds of thousands of not only Nigerians, but, but Africans in UK, in Europe, and many of them, or most of them, or perhaps all of them, want to know more. Jess Castellotte, Prince Shilon, thank you so much for joining me, and congratulations to the Yemizi Shilon Museum of Art on winning our Museum Opening of the Year award. Our second award is for Exhibition of the Year. We're only too aware that staging exhibitions this year has been a brain-bending, back-breaking task. Some have had to close early. Others, against the odds, have been rescheduled or extended to ensure that as many people as possible might be able to enjoy them. I'm certain that in coming years, we won't see exhibition schedules as frenetic as they have been, but that we will see ingenuity and resourcefulness coming to the fore. I hope our shortlist will still
provide inspiration for serious and seriously imaginative exhibitions in the future. The shortlist is Artemisia at the National Gallery in London, Leonardo da Vinci at the Louvre in Paris, Peter de Hock in Delft from the shadow of Vermeer at the Museum Prinzenhof in Delft, Sahel, Art and Empire on the Shores of the Sahara at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, Van Eyck, An Optical Revolution at the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent, and Vida Americana, Mexican muralists remake American art, 1925 to 45, at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. The winner is an exhibition that, with momentous ambition, refreshed our vision of an artist who many of us thought we knew. Its organizers arranged extraordinary loans, took risks with its display, and created an event that really did feel like it could never be repeated. The Apollo Award for Exhibition of the Year goes to Van Eyck, An Optical Revolution, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent. And I'm thrilled that we're joined now from the museum by the exhibition's project leader, Johan de Smet. Well, it's of course a special honor for the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent to be awarded Best Exhibition of the Year 2020. And we are very pleased to share with you the memory of the exhibition from Egg, An Optical Revolution. The award is a highly appreciated recognition of the work of an entire museum team that, under the leadership of museum director Catherine Verleysen, turned the exhibition into an unseen and successful event. What made the exhibition a unique moment for the museum, the city of Ghent, and far beyond is that it took place at the museum where, since 2012, the restoration of the Ghent altarpiece is being carried out by the Royal Institute of Cultural Heritage. This presence in the museum gave rise to the idea of sharing with the general public new insights in Van Eyck's oeuvre. Essential was the loan of the exterior panels of the Ghent altarpiece, and we cannot express enough our appreciation to the church wardens of St. Bavos Cathedral for allowing this highly exceptional loan. With these panels at their core, the curatorial team consisting of Til Hogerborger, Jan Dumoulin, Max Martens, Frederike van Damme and myself, built a parcours of 13 galleries around the central, central teams in Van Eyck's oeuvre. The result, never before has the visitor been able to get so close to the stunning beauty and unseen mastery of Van Eyck. The exhibition became a reality through the selfless support of numerous partners, of course, the cathedral and the numerous lenders all over the world, the city of Ghent, Flemish government, touristic partners such as Visit Ghent and Visit Flanders, and of course, the entire complementary museum team, the sponsors, and num numerous supporting partners. Each special exhibition lives on in different ways. And in the case of our exhibition, this certainly applies to the beautiful catalog published by Cannibal Clemson Hudson, which can continue to count on wide interest. And in, in addition, Visit Flanders and the Museum of Fine Arts, Art joined forces to develop an online virtual tour of the Van Eyck Gallery. While scrolling through the images, one will discover over 120 masterpieces still available for all through the museum's website. In this way, we will keep the memory alive of a remarkable exhibition, which today has been awarded the prestigious Apollo Award Exhibition of the Year. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Johan. And, and I have to say that uh, your exhibition uh, um, did provide for me this extraordinary consolation in, in the months after I saw it. Um, of course, you had to close the exhibition early due to the pandemic regulations. I, I wondered if I could ask you personally, what after image it's left you with? Well, it's hard to say, but it has been for only six weeks, but uh, this, these six weeks, it has been a real feast at the museum, looking at a uh, number of people, uh, some 130,000 people came to the museum during these weeks, and to see how happy they were to be able to come here and have all the time to look at uh, this uh, mastery painting. And in all that time you spent working on the exhibition, would you say that you learned new things about Van Eyck that you hadn't considered before? I've been looking for uh, the Kent Artifice in, in wrong ways. It had been uh, for so, so many parts had been overpainted. And it was uh, a really uh, unbelievable, um, unimaginable uh, experience to be near to that wonder uh, that uh, happened during the restoration. Well, for those of us who visited, it genuinely was a wonder to behold it. Congratulations again, Johan, and to the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent for winning the Exhibition of the Year Award. The third award is for Book of the Year. We have a robust shortlist that covers imaginative works of criticism, elegant biography, and quite formidable feats of scholarship. The shortlist is The Age of Undress, Art, Fashion, and the Classical Ideal in the 1790s by Amelia Rouser, published by Yale University Press. Builder Atlas Many Mosini, The Original, by A.B. Warburg, edited by Axel Heil and Roberto Ort, and published by Hattia Kantz. A rare treatise on interior decoration and architecture, Joseph Friedrich Zurachnitz's Presentation and History of the Taste of the Leading Nations, by Rachnitz, but edited and translated by Simon Swinfen Jervis, published by the Getty Research Institute. Sophonisba's Lesson, a Renaissance artist and her work by Michael W. Cole through Princeton University Press. Spirit of Place, Artists, Writers and the British Landscape by Susan Owens, published by Thames and Hudson. And Warhol, A Life as Art by Blake Gopnik, published by Alan Lane. The winner is a book that is a work of reconstruction reconstruction of one of the greatest and most esoteric art historical projects of all time and yet a reconstruction that feels supremely relevant in a year in which we have all relied on images and their circulation images being perhaps its central concern and have relied on them more than ever this book is a welcome reminder that scholarship entails imaginative or sympathetic voyages as much as dedication and persistence. The Apollo Book of the Year for 2020 is Builder Atlas Many Mosini by A.B. Warburg, edited by Roberto Ort and Axel Heil. They are here with me now, as is Claudia Vedapol, archivist from the Warburg Institute in London. Oh, thank you so much. We are very pleased to hear that <clears throat> and very surprised in such a year where such a big book um, get, uh, gets the prize for the best book of the year because it's almost unhandled in the book. Thanks a lot for, for uh, awarding us. And uh, regarding the, the long term and the long research over the last 10 years, and finally uh, holding the the folio, this huge 40 to 60 centimeters book in our hands, 
was a, a great surprise and, and helped us to survive uh, the last months with this incredible Abbey Warburg universe. And just succinctly for both of you, what is the Builder Atlas for you? What does it mean to you both personally? The Builder Atlas is a, <clears throat> is a big uh, uh, riddle. It's very difficult to read uh, these panels. And uh, when we started to do it, we thought we would do it only for three months. And it took us, uh, it sucked us in. So we were, uh, uh, we had to follow and finally we did it for more than uh, eight years now. So it is a, it's an unknown territory and it's an, uh, it's a, it's a white territory of the map of uh, art history. And these, these principles of Warburg of uh, serendipity and, and uh, the, the possibility that Warburg's Denkraum uh, brought us into a completely new orbit and uh, made, made it possible for us to, to look at the, the images of, of many thousand years of all mankind in a completely different way. Well, thank you both. I'm going to turn to Claudia Vedapol now to ask her a couple of questions about what it's meant for the Warburg Institute. Well, for us, it's a, it's a big uh, opportunity or it has been a big opportunity to, to get more visibility and to reach a much wider audience than we normally do as an academic institution. Um, and of course, it has to be seen together with the exhibition, which had a huge feedback in the international press from all around the world. And, and finally, seeing the Builder Atlas as a publication and indeed as an exhibition, what have you personally learned about Warburg? Yeah, I've been a scholar of Warburg and his, his work, his materials for a long time. I've been looking at the Atlas for a long time and trying to get sort of to grips with it. It's a very enigmatic work. But seeing everything now out on panels and especially perhaps even more in the exhibition as a sequence of panels where you don't have to turn pages. In the book, of course, you do. It just gives you new insights into the ideas behind them. You can study things um, much better closely. Um, you have to think about um, the ideas behind it when looking at the newly made captions or revised captions. So it just um, sort of reminded me of thinking again a little bit deeper in about the ideas behind the Atlas which is such an intriguing, huge and monumental work for everybody. Well, I'm sure that it will deepen many of our understandings uh, and indeed that visibility is a wonderful thing. So congratulations again to the contributors uh, to the Builder Atlas project, uh, our book of the year. Thank you, thank you very much. We move on to the Apollo Award for Acquisition of the Year. In recent months, actual or proposed sales from certain museums have received more coverage than acquisitions that others have made. But at Apollo, we want to continue to celebrate museum acquisitions that transform collections, whether through gift or purchase, either because they complement existing holdings or demonstrate how a museum is rethinking its collection and what pathways that rethinking might open up for its audiences. The shortlist I give now provides highlights from a much longer selection that is published in the December issue of Apollo. The shortlist is Derek Jarman's Prospect Cottage in Dungeness in Kent, acquired by Art Fund. 103 drawings by Katsushika Hokusai, acquired by the British Museum in London. Avant et Après by Paul Gauguin at the Courtauld Institute of Art, London. 39 Dutch drawings at the John Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. The album Amicorum, compiled by Philip Heinhofer 
at the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel. More than 375 works of fine and decorative art from the collection of Jane Reitzman at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Pierre-Paul Proudhon's The Soul Breaking Its Bonds with the Earth, which has gone to the Louvre in Paris. And 455 works from the collection of Carlo del Bravo at the Uffizi Galleries in Florence. The winner of this award is a triumph for collaboration and for all that it received money from funding bodies and trusts, it really is testament to the strength of what a public campaign can make possible. The public donations contributed so significantly to the acquisition, a testament to the broad and committed public that recognises the value of the arts. The Apollo Award for Acquisition of the Year goes to Art Fund for Prospect Cottage. And I'm delighted that we're joined by Alice Regent, Head of Individual Giving at Art Fund, and who led the campaign. Thank you, Tom. And I am thrilled to be accepting this award on behalf of Art Fund. Prospect Cottage is a work of art like no other. Derek Jarman transformed this fisherman's hut in Dungeness into a sanctuary where all aspects of his work came together as a filmmaker, as an artist, an activist, a gardener, and so much more. The cottage is filled with art made by Derek Jarman and his friends alongside props from his films and surrounded by a remarkable garden that he coaxed from the shingle beach. More than 25 years after his death, it's a site of pilgrimage for people all over the world who come to be inspired by its beauty, just as Jarman was. But this year, Prospect Cottage was at risk of being sold privately and its contents dispersed and artistic legacy lost. So Art Fund, the UK's national charity for art, launched a crowdfunding appeal to save it for the nation. We launched this in January and the response was incredible. We raised over 3.5 million to save Prospect Cottage against a 10 week deadline, uh, making this the biggest arts crowdfunding appeal in history. And this is all thanks to over 8,300 donations from members of the public. Uh, we were also sport, uh, spurred forward by uh, major grants from the National Heritage Memorial Fund, the Limbury Trust, the Luma Foundation and many others. And crucially, we were helped by many of Jarman's friends and collaborators and artists who helped us rally support in many, many different ways. So Prospect Cottage now has a bright future. Creative Folkestone will become the custodians of the cottage and run an artistic residency program for writers, artists, filmmakers, academics, and, and many, many more, uh, so that it can continue to inspire new work long into the future. And Jarman's archive from the cottage will now join the Tate archive um, and be publicly available for the first time. So the, this campaign, it was a huge challenge and the success is testament to just how important Jarman's work is to so many people. And it closed uh, the campaign at, at the end of March, which was an incredibly difficult time for everybody. And yet people kept on donating, it was amazing. And, um, it was just so heartening to see people come together to support access to art against all odds in this way. And at Art Fund, this is the heart of what we do. Um, we believe this has never been more important than right now at the moment when um, museums, galleries, public art collections are facing huge challenges. So this week, we are launching a new campaign together for museums. Our aim is to raise 1 million to help UK museums to build their resilience in these very, very challenging times. And so we hope as many people as possible will once again go to the Art Fund website, join us and donate to make this happen. But in the meantime, our heartfelt thanks to all of those who played a huge part in securing the future of Prospect Cottage and to Apollo for this award. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alice. If I can just ask you quickly, do, do you remember, was there a moment for you when you were convinced that Prospect Cottage had to be saved and that a campaign could really do that? I think the moment for me personally was visiting it. 
it is the most incredible place. Um, on Dungeness, this, this stark, very beautiful landscape and this unusual building sort of comes out of nowhere and stepping inside to see what he made of it. You can see how it has inspired not only him in so many areas of, of what he did, but also so many other people. And so all of us felt incredibly strongly that this was a remarkable place of British cultural heritage, as well as just a place in its own right. And as the ball started rolling with the campaign, we were just overwhelmed by how many people came forward because they had personally been touched by his work, perhaps as an artist, as a queer rights activist, as a gardener. Um, it was the sort of rolling stone gathering moss that told us that this campaign had a real chance of success. Um, um, Alice Regent, thank you very much and congratulations to Art Fund uh, for winning the Acquisition of the Year Award. Thank you. In a year in which museums and arts organisations have become digital prospects more than physical destinations, our Digital Innovation of the Year Award has taken on a new significance. The shortlist celebrates a number of projects that have responded to a world in which remote connectivity has become mandatory for us all. But we do hope that they retain their value when something like life as we knew it returns. The shortlist is Art is Where the Home Is, a project from First Sight in Colchester, The Botanical Mind Online, run by the Camden Arts Centre, Digital Mycenae from Cambridge University Library, Julia Stoshek Online, The Morgan Connected, The Morgan Library and Museum, New York, and Sketchfab for Cultural Heritage. Our winner is a museum project that has stood out from its peers this year for the intelligence with which it's capitalised on existing resources while carefully adding new ones, for its carefully and clearly articulated and integrated vision, and above all, for its sustained effort to communicate with and build its audience. The Apollo Award for Digital Innovation of the Year goes to the Morgan Library and Museum for the Morgan Connected. I'm thrilled that we have Colin Bailey the director of the Morgan Library and Museum on the line now. Thank you so much, Thomas. We are so excited about this award. When the pandemic hit on March 13, which seems like such a long time ago, we immediately pivoted to online activity. And we have eight curatorial departments, the conservation department, a very active media uh, team as well. And we began to realize that we could introduce all of our collections through our curators on Morgan Connected. We started doing these, sending these out twice a week. Um, they are full of content of all the different departments that we have from music to medieval manuscripts to up to modern and contemporary art, to books and to uh, bindings. And we have found that this has really given a large swath of our, of our members, of our supporters and of the, of the public in large, meaningful education, relief, Colin, it's, it's been a very busy year for museums and libraries in the digital realm. To me, the Morgan Connected feels, as it were, more joined up than some online programmes of, of other institutions. What, what were the principles that lay behind the launch of the Morgan Connected? In a way, we had been digitising our collections for years. Uh, particularly because 90% of our works are on paper in books that cannot be seen in the light, in, in, natural, in the daylight, as it were. And so the, my, my sense was that our curators are excellent scholars and wonderful communicators. And we began to engage them as part of our media company. And they began to give talks, seminars, instameets, discussions, lectures, with basically from their computers at home, using much of the research and the imaging that had been done for some time. And this, I think, is the heart of the institution, and it became the heart of the programming. And, and of course, a, a director can never know the entirety of the collection that, that they are, as it were, the chief steward of. Um, but I wanted to ask you what perhaps 
was your favorite material that you discovered in the Morgan during during this time through its digital resources? Well, I think for me, the, I, I'll just mention three things quickly. One was a beautiful talk called Interstellar Social Distancing. And it was about the drawings for Antoine Saint-Exupéry's Little Prince, which we acquired in the 60s. Then we had a, a young, one of our young music curators doing a, view, a purview, a review of the Morgan's music collection, a millennium of music at the Morgan. And he was so adept at being able to integrate recordings, imaging, and sound. And finally, um, a co conversation between our conservator and a curator of medieval art around this 15th century black hours, um, of, of this extraordinary vellum book of hours that again, you would rarely be able to turn the pages and see. And so those, as well as tours of exhibitions, lectures on different artists and different writers, those, those have really stood out for me. Well, Colin, uh, congratulations to the Morgan Library and Museum for winning the Apollo Award for Digital Innovation of the Year. Thomas, thank you so much. We're very, very honoured. We come to our award for the Apollo Artist of the Year. This is never an easy category to judge and perhaps more so than ever in 2020. But all of the artists on the shortlist have in the past 12 months held exhibitions that have addressed how we approach the world visually and how art might help us to redress it too. The shortlist is Steve McQueen, Shirin Neshat, Toyin Oji Odutola, Howardina Pindell, Gerhard Richter, and Bridget Riley. The winner is an artist whose work is generous in its figuration, opening up a space for conversation about power and oppression, but wise to the complex implications of that gesture. Her extraordinary series of charcoal, pastel and chalk drawings of a fictional ancient civilization went on display at the Barbican this summer and its images and ideas have reached far beyond the physical audience who have been lucky enough to see it. A countervailing theory, as it's titled, offered an ambivalent fantasy that helped us to imagine a new world before many of us realised that we would need one. The Apollo Artist of the Year is Toyin Oji Odutola, and Toyin has recorded the following message for us. Thank you so much to Apollo Magazine for this incredible honor. Um, to be nominated amongst the selection this year, Sharin Nishat, Sir Stephen McQueen, um, Howardina Pendel, Bridget Riley, Gerhard Richter is insane. Um, I'm just trying to grapple with that. Um, but this, in a time when so much is going on and, and to have art be some form of engagement and solace and a place where people can really think about the issues that are going on right now and to be a part of that group who all contributed so much and have contributed so much in their careers is is the gravity of that is, is truly hitting me um i i have so many people to thank for all the things that have happened this year but particularly with the show at the Barbican Center, um, A Countervailing Theory, which I built last year and was just thinking a lot about the compounded history of engaging with the UK, um, my first time ever showing in the country and all the histories there and, and contending with that and, and providing a space for the audience to to really think seriously and critically about their position in, in a society where so much has built into the reality that we live in now. And as much as, as painful as it's been and trying as it's been, a lot of the injustices and collective 
suffering that's happened that was addressed in the show aren't new. Um, I'd hoped, if, if at all, that the show would be a place where people could ask or pu push past the easy answers and really ask it and get into the meat of the difficult questions and see themselves in that and see how they can not only challenge ideas about what a just society looks like, a true society looks like, but their own involvement in that and their own complicity in that, uh, as I did in, in creating it. And so um, to have the engagement that it's had to so many people who came to see it, it's such a privilege, um, especially during uh, a global pandemic is, 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 in, is incredible. And I will carry that with me forever. Um, there's so many people I want to thank, um, Joanna, Calvin, Aaron, Bill, Rob, Anna, um, so many people at Jack Shaman Gallery, um, Lom, John, Amanda, um, my family, um, just everyone who helped make this possible, all the preparators at the Barbican Center, Margaret who did the lighting, did an amazing job, Peter who did the soundscape. Um, but more than anything, I want to thank my parents. Um, this is for you, Mama and Pops. We come to our final award for the Apollo Personality of the Year. It has been an uncompromisingly difficult year for all of us, whether we work in the arts or not. And the art sector, like many other fields, has suffered greatly. What we call the art world only exists because of the work and wit and ways of seeing and thinking of artists. Although, strangely, between the hullabaloo of art fairs and auctions and the haven of museums, it sometimes feels as though artists are taken for granted. Our personality of the year is an artist. An artist who launched an initiative in the spring that has allowed thousands of other artists to generate income as their anticipated sources of earning dried up. Through the beguilingly simple but extraordinarily effective Artist Support Pledge, artists have made more than £70 million of sales, all at affordable prices, and on the understanding that at the threshold of £1,000, they would put something back into that system making a purchase of a work by another artist themselves. Our personality of the year is the founder of that scheme, the founder of Artist Support Pledge, Matthew Burrows. I'm really pleased to say that we have Matthew on the line now. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Apollo, and for everyone who nominated me. Uh, needless to say, I'm absolutely thrilled. Of course, uh, I see this as a shared triumph for the whole of the Artist Support Pledge community. It's artists, it's makers, it's buyers, it's supporters inside and outside of the arts industry. I suppose I should also thank, make a personal thank you at least to those people who've guided me and advised me through this period, especially Natalie Melton, John Treadway, Katie Campbell, Javier Pess, Simon Burton, Chris Gilvan Cartwright, and my wife, Liz Gilmore, for a calm head, patience, and diplomacy. When I started Art Support Pledge, I was a very basic user of Instagram. Indeed, there were days on end when the first few words I wrote into Google were, how do I? That is now all history. We now have over 450,000 posts and artists and makers have benefited across the world. The success of our support pledge really is down to a very simple formula. I share, you share, we all share. It's a broad artistic ecosystem and it can look a little wild at times, but it makes for a much more sustainable and equitable culture for all. So, Thank you, Apollo. Um, it's a real privilege to be awarded this. And thank you everyone who has participated in Artist Support Pledge. 
Thanks, Matthew. And if I can just ask you a, a couple of questions um, a, about Artist Support Pledge. Was, was it um, something that you'd been mulling for a while, how you could create something of this equitable nature? Or did the pandemic give rise to the idea quite quickly? A bit of both, really. I've played with the idea of sort of generous cultures for a long time. And I believe that artists and art communities work best when we have a, a, a kind of grounding within a, a culture of trust and generosity, we trust one another to support one another and to be generous and to give a little bit more to um, the community that we share, but also to each other's practices. So I've always sort of worked with this idea and when the pandemic struck, our support pledge really was a response to not only the pandemic, but it, to the nature of that generous culture. And I mean, the scale of the response has been quite extraordinary, really. Did, did, did it surprise you how quickly it took off and, and the, the number of artists who, who were pledging? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, within the first 24 hours, um, it had already started to go viral. And I remember having a kind of conversation with my family where we were talking about what would happen if we got to a thousand participants or a thousand posts. And that just seemed impossible. And within, I think within the first day or two, we'd surpassed that. And it just kept growing. In fact, it was growing almost a thousand posts per day for the first few weeks. I mean, it's it's extraordinary that that's that viral nature of the initiative. Uh, can you tell me? Did did you have you discovered things about artists or particular artists that you didn't know through it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's I, I've got a lot more friends now than I had <laughs> nine months ago, um, but I've met and discussed, you know, what our support pledge is with artists all over the world. Uh, in, in so many different countries with different needs. Indeed, this morning I was talking to artists in India uh, and trying to find a way of connecting them and making it more effective for them. Because though this, this formula is very simple and anyone can do it, um, there are kind of limitations on language and there are barriers um, that I wasn't expecting, you know, at the beginning. Language that I use might not be understood globally so there's always sort of little nuances I'm playing with. So it's, it's, it's been extraordinarily humbling for me to have to deal with that every day. And sometimes, you know, many, many instances like that every day. Matthew Bar Burrows, uh, congratulations on being the, art the Apollo personality of the year. And, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's been an absolute honour. Thank you. That concludes the Apollo Awards ceremony for 2020. I hope you've enjoyed watching. And I hope that you'll join me in a toast wherever you are in the world to the winners. Cheers.